programs for about five, six weeks now, and they're always interesting, they're always fun. Um, we don't try, try to pretend we're brilliant experts in a topic or anything like that. Basically, we just get together and talk about something. I like to call it comparing notes. We say what we know rather than spending 100 years, you know, preparing for something and pretending we're brilliant. We just kind of get together as, as fellow entrepreneurs, talk about what we know about a given topic, and, and we always learn from them. And on this one, I think we'll learn a lot. I, I have to learn a lot because um, it's something I'm really interested in. Um, today, we're going to be talking about startup acceleration programs, um, venture and startup acceleration programs. As always, we're having technical glitches. I hope, can everybody still hear me? Yes. Okay, my, my video just turned to a picture of me and me and a lot, a lot of other people's do. Um, technical glitches are the rule, really, the exception in these kinds of things. So if that happens, just deal with them. If I drop out, deal with that. Just take over and just talk, and we'll, we'll worry about it later. It happens, and just learn to live with it. So I'm going to go around and uh, try to introduce everybody. Um, let's start with, um, how about Elizabeth? I've known Elizabeth for, gosh, years online, and this is the first time I've met her in, in semi-real life. Um, I believe she's a personal chef in the Washington, D.C. area, but Elizabeth, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and I'm a personal chef. Um, I've been a personal chef for eight years, and I'm in the Philadelphia area. Why did I think Washington, D.C.? I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> so that's great. She's a small business woman, which is what we want here. I'm sorry? Um, how about Jerry next? Jerry? Oh, who, who's that? Uh, uh, Jerry Schumann. With, um, why don't you introduce yourself? What city are you at? Do you have interest in accelerators, or what's your interest in this topic? Yeah, I'm actually in a lifelong serial entrepreneur in Southern California. So basically started about eight companies. I've been involved in an investment bank uh, in Los Angeles for about two years. And uh, so I've pretty much got a vested interest in uh, everything startup, and especially when it comes to uh, attempt to raise money at both the seed, angel, and uh, VC levels. Oh, that's awesome. You, I, you're going to know a lot more about this topic than I do. So, um, you know, by all means, I, I'm going to introduce people and that kind of stuff. I'm going to say what I think about it and a few things we're doing, but beyond that, not too much. Um, Lauren, my friend Lauren, who is in the Palm Springs area of um, California, can you hear us, Lauren? You're coming, I think, on, on audio only. No, Lauren can't hear us. Let's go to um, Christopher. He's also, I, I don't know if he'll be able to hear us. We tried to talk. Christopher, I believe, is in Alabama. Christopher, can you hear us? Maybe not. We'll, we'll do these introductions later. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Shalea? Shalea Sparks, can you hear us? Okay, who did I, I don't miss? think a lot of people realize they're muted for one. Yeah, check your microphones. It's in the upper, um, upper right-hand corner, the one, two, three, four, the fifth icon to the from the right hand corner. It's a little microphone. So if, if you're muted, uncheck that, please. Oh, and uh, Tim, Tim Sutherland, can you hear us? Okay, I'll tell you what. If, if we didn't get you on introduction, we'll get you on the, the conversation. You can introduce yourself during the conversation. I want to go now to, um, to Sandy Fleischer. I hope I pronounced your name. Fleischer. Fleischer, I'm sorry. Um, Sandy is in Los Angeles, and she's actually in a um, in an acceleration program. She's the only one. So, uh, Sandy, why don't you both introduce yourself and and take a little bit longer spiel? Tell us what you're doing and, and a little bit about your acceleration program because it sounds fascinating to me. So, why don't you take the floor for a bit? Well, okay. I'm Sandy Fischler, and um, I'm in a program for the Founder Institute, which is one basically the world's largest accelerator program right now. Um, let me look up and see how many cities they have going. They just added Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It's on their um, their thing, but they have um, oh, how many? Come on, come on, come on, come on! Browser, browser, browser. Forty cities across five continents. So they're they're worldwide right now. They've launched almost a thousand companies. 
Um, they're one of the, the largest accelerators in the world. The, um, the program we're doing, it's a six-week accelerator program. We're starting from the ideation phase. The, and to get accepted into this program, you don't actually have to walk in the door with an idea. Um, they're really looking for people who have the right temperament, the right, the, the right mental capabilities, and j the ability to jump in and, and take an idea and run with it. So the actual idea is not the criteria that gets you accepted into the program. It's your, your capabilities as an entrepreneur. So that being said, um, we're just coming out of the ideation phase. We've all chosen an idea. We've beaten it with the, the numbers stick now. So we're, we're in business model phase of going from, do we have a functional idea? Can you make money with it? Who is your market? How are you going to get them to pay? And then we're, we're moving into like product development and naming and some other areas from there. Oh, that, that's fascinating. Just to uh, let you know the way um, we're going to be handling this is, this is going to be more of a jump in and talk when you feel like it, because I don't have any kind of organized presentation set up. I, I know a few things about accelerators. I am very interested in it, but, but I don't have, I've never been in one. Um, but a few things struck me from what Sandy just said as being kind of intriguing. One, th one thing she said is, you don't have to have an idea when, when, you, uh, when you join them. That's been, I think, a new trend in accelerators, and I find it really interesting that they've had, they think of the ideas as less important than the people. And, um, you know, I, that's just really intriguing for a number of reasons for me, because I think you really, a lot of people really get stuck on their ideas. When, mm -hmm. um, when you're an entrepreneur. And I know that the venture capitalist types say, always say, don't ever let that happen because you know that buzzword they use, pivot, you're always gonna pivot anyway. And I see it all the time where people just get totally, and, and including me, you know, it's the, the pot calling the kettle here. Um, you think your idea is brilliant and it blinds you for, for, for seeing other, other good stuff out there. Um, anybody wanna weigh in on that? I don't wanna hog the floor here. So anybody, somebody jump in, just, you know, we'll, we'll just kinda, um, how about Jerry? Jerry, why don't you give us your thoughts? We're, we're going to kind of go around. Is your microphone muted, Jerry? Yeah, you guys were actually breaking up pretty bad for me, so I, I didn't really clearly hear the question. Could you, or what you oh, were We were talking about how ideas are not considered as important um, as the actual entrepreneur in accelerators now. Uh, yeah, that that does uh, well. Different accelerators will, will will of course look at different aspects of that. Um, there are there are a number of accelerators that are very focused from a technology standpoint, and and a lot of them do, or some of them do require to have some level of early concept stages of what you're doing. But yeah, there there is a a lot of accelerators are almost taking on the form of um, uh, almost hackathons and networking, where basically it's it's you and your potential uh, brought to bear with a group of others that might be in the same, you know, in the same accelerator, and putting those capabilities together ends up creating, you know, some phenomenal idea, or at least that's the the concepts of it. These are all kind of adaptations, I think, of uh, early on and what Bill Gross was doing uh, at I at Idea Labs and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, there there are a number of different accelerators that basically. Bring yourself is kind of the scenario. If you get accepted in, that's kind of what they're looking for. Well, that, that's another that's that's another interesting idea. That there's really a range of different kinds of accelerators. I mean, you could even call Startup Weekend a kind of accelerator. Um, you yeah, you there's know, a, and, there's even accelerators that are like in the makerspace. I mean, if you take a look, which is a very interesting uh, area for accelerators. So, um, like, I think everyone's aware of Square by now, uh, which is the payment processing thing that you slap on. The little fob you slap on your iPad, your iPhone, and they'll let you process credit cards. You know they've taken the world by storm, especially in the space of you know individual uh, independent vendors and uh, you know hairstylists and you name it. They're doing you know over a billion transactions or whatever it is. It's it's a crazy amount. But that was actually started out of basically what is in 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 essence a maker accelerator um, out of San Francisco. So there are accelerators that range across the board from everything that are very software centric to ones that are looking into 3D printing, looking into light manufacturing. I mean, it, it runs the gamut in regards to uh, that, that space. Yeah, there's something else I want to mention, um, that they do work. 
<laughs> um, and this is what got me intrigued by it because I um, I have a, a Google alert set up for accelerators, and I'm starting to try to learn more about it. We're talking about the idea of building a virtual accelerator uh, here on Google+. Plus. We're pretty serious about it. Um, but a few things. The big ones, like um, most people have probably heard of Y Combinator or Techstars. Those are now called like the Harvard Business Schools of this era. They are harder to get into than, um, than Harvard Business School. Y Combinator, I think they only take less than 100 people a year. And they're fiercely competitive. Um, so um, why don't you weigh in on that, Sandy? What do you think? How hard was it to get on yours? Um, for, for me, it was actually strikingly easy, which, it, you know, I, I can't say how hard it would be. Apparently, something like 50% of the people who take the test um, to get into FI fail it. And again, it's not about the idea. They put you through a a series of, and it's not even an IQ test, it's, it's a test that measures your ability to keep different streams of thought going. So there's a lot of pattern matching because the, the idea behind it is, is that as a CEO, you've got to be able to look at this piece of data, that piece of data, this piece of data, and look at the patterns and see what's going on with your company, see what's going on with your market. So you need to be able to keep multiple streams of information rolling at the same time. So that's, that's what they're looking for, is, is, is honesty in who you are and where your flaws are, where you need to beef yourself up, and your ability to, to manage enormous quantities of data and look for patterns. Oh, that, that's interesting. Could you tell us a little bit about what you actually do in your accelerator? Do you meet every day or twice a week, or what do you do in the meetings? Because I, I don't have that much of a feel for it. I know we, they're all different. Uh, we, um, we meet once a week on Monday night for about four hours and we do two to four mentor presentations during that time and then we do pitch practice. We, we all have to get up and, and start working on our pitches and we have working groups. Everyone in the class is broken up into like five to six people into a working group and your working group, we, you, you meet two to three times a week on conference calls or even get together if you're close enough with the working group. And it's, it's in these little working groups that you hash out your ideas, you, you bounce your pitches off of each other, and use those as, a, as kind of a little creative launch pad for the bigger sessions. Now, is the working group all working on a single idea, or do you have your own independent ideas, and you all, all support our, each other? We all have our own independent ideas, and we all support each other. Okay, okay. And how are you matched in those working groups? Is personality or interest? Uh, the, uh, the, the director of, of the LA and San Diego FI does not want to reveal her, uh, her method for matching people in groups. <laughs> okay. She, it's a secret sauce. She's not going to tell us. Okay. We've asked. Okay. And another thing I want to bring into this discussion here a little bit randomly is I did mention we are pretty seriously thinking of, of building a virtual accelerator. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's been done before. I don't think it's been done on Google Plus yet. We've got this wonderful Hangout technology. Um, but as... Um, as Jerry pointed out, there are all sorts of different kinds of accelerators. And one I'm particularly interested in is, is microenterprise. Small little ventures run by one person. Um, and they, I think it's just the numbers are vast and huge and uncounted. It's just a, a huge underserved demographic. Um, oh, I agree. I, and, yeah, that, I, and I think that's the trend. It, it's the trend. Um, more people are now, in the United States, more people are outside of the workforce than are in it. Um, like 100 million of us. Just, well, and also, you know, we're not in the system anymore. Go ahead. Also, older people, because the, um, for those of us who, who've crossed that 45 barrier, if we lose a job or leave an industry, our chances of getting rehired are slim to none. You're sunk. You're sunk after yeah, you're, you're 50. Yeah, you're toast. You're toast. You're toast. And I, I, I'm suffering, and I don't mind yeah. saying that. I'll Oh, everybody I know in this age range is suffering. Yeah, and I, I actually talked with, with a couple of VC types about starting uh, an over 40 accelerator, limited by age. I'm, I'm a very inclusive person. I don't like limiting people on anything, but um, that idea has a little bit of traction. I might revisit that at some some point. But what I was trying to get on the, on the, the vast number, maybe it's not in the U.S., but in the world, of independent entrepreneurs, Maybe entrepreneurs because they're forced to be entrepreneurs. There's no place else to go. Corporations don't want us anymore. Um, we're just there. 
Um, so I think this that's a trend driving this accelerator movement, and there's a lot of them. I mentioned my my um, uh, my Google Alerts feed. There's just I saw I heard one about in Mississippi they're, they're throwing a hundred million dollars into it. I mean this is not chicken scratch. They're doing it every part of the world, the most podunk places. One in some little rural community in northern Michigan, the Upper Peninsula. They're all over the place now. This is not just Silicon Valley anymore. So what I wanted to get to with this um, uh, micro venture, people like me, people that are just kind of not making this account. I don't want to say everybody's not making the economy. I'm not. Um, you're not doing it nearly as well as I, I would like. Um, but. How can we help those people? And this, Elizabeth, I'm going to pick on you on this one because you've got you've got an interesting little venture. You're a personal chef. Um, I assume you work mostly alone. But what would you need? I mean, if if you wanted to work with other people in a supportive environment, help your business grow and get better, is there anything you can think you would need? Mm. Someone to do my accounting. Yeah, everybody's bad at accounting. That's um, my favorite part of much. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there's a whole range. I think one size does not fit all in micro ventures. I think everybody needs something. Different. Some people would need marketing. Um, a lot of people would need technology. And one thing I've noticed, you know, I've got this um, this business coaches. I call it. It's a it's a shared circle. I call it business. Business and life coaches, advisors, and mentors, and there's some really great people in there. But I've noticed a flaw in that community, um, or in that whatever it is, that group of that profession. Uh, they got kind of a one size fits all mentality. They, a lot of them were, were successful at one thing, and they think you can step in the same river twice. They said, "Well, I was successful doing this, therefore, all other people have to do is do the same thing I did." And uh, and they'll be successful too. Any thoughts about that? I hope you can still hear me. My, uh, my little icon went out again. Am I still online? Yeah, you're still there. Okay, I panicked. <laughs> Did I shock everybody with that? What I said was so brilliant. But uh, <laughs> the one size fits all. Has anyone else noticed that? That or do you get? Do you get? Let me let me ask it not in a not loaded way. Do business advisors work? Who has a business advisor? Uh, Elizabeth, do you have a business advisor? I don't. Do you want one, or have you ever wanted one? Um, no, um, I haven't had I haven't had one, and um, I guess if there if <clears throat> there'd be nice, it would be nice to meet with someone about um, um, better advertising tactics and marketing. Um, but uh, about running um, specials or um, particularly on um, holidays or um, special times, specific times of the year, that would be good. Uh, but I I like to I like to keep things. Um, I guess I have a kind of a control issue that I, I like to do everything myself. Well, you know what? I, I'm going to jump in because I think that's actually typical. Another, you know, another thing about you know the vast number of solopreneurs, if I can use that word, in the United States and probably the world, is. They kind of like it, <laughs> you know. Once once you've been out, it's hard to go back to the corporate world, even if they wanted us, which they don't. Um, you kind of do get used to working alone, but I still think we've got to find ways, better ways, to work together. So, Sandy, what do you think about um, what do you think about that? And also the business advisor question. I assume you. I think I've heard you mention you like your advisors, but what are your thoughts about that? Do you eventually want your company to have employees, or what's what's your vision? I think I asked you about five questions in one thing. So <laughs> answer whatever one you feel like. <laughs> well, in an ideal world, I would uh, not be a boss nor have a boss. Um, but that's um, in order to build what I need to build and do what I need to do. Which you know, quite frankly, I need to build a retirement plan. Um, I need to build something a little bigger than just 
a, a solopreneur because I I've been doing the solo thing for a very long time, and that's been very well, but it's not going to it's not creating a retirement account for me, and you know I'm I'm at an age where that's starting to weigh on me quite a bit. You know there there just is no pension plan for for those of us who are solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. That's that's just the reality of life. So I'm trying to to figure out what I can build that's going to get me somewhere where I can actually put some money away and and have a shot at being a retired person, you know, lounging around in plaid pants and hitting the golf links or something. Yeah. Boy, I'm I'm in denial on that whole question, but but I mean, you've hit on an issue that I mean, it's massive, mm -hmm. and I I don't think people. I know we're getting off the accelerator topic a little bit here, but. Well, no, we're not actually, because your your motivations are key. Yeah. And the you have to make early decisions when you're creating a company. I'm I'm actually reading a book right now called The Founder's Dilemma, and in the very first chapter, he talks about you you have to decide when you're starting a company whether you want to be king or whether you want to be wealthy, because you probably can't be both. Yeah. There, there's this um, this old book. I'm real old from the 80s, I think. It's called Business Plans That Make Cash. It's from the um, MIT Enterprise Forum. And there's a great chapter in here called What Do You Want to Be When You Grow Up? And what they what they say is, you know, it's not just everybody kind of thinks, well, I'll just have this big successful company. But there's a lot of different kinds of successful companies. You know, some people want to be an inventor. They like to dabble around inventing things. And they go through all the different kinds. Some people do want that massive megapolis. Some people want to build it and then sell it and then build another one, the serial entrepreneurs type. And they identify about 12 different kinds. I won't try to remember and go over it here, but um, maybe I'll make a post about that later because even though it's really old, it has some really good wisdom. But another thing I want to say about what you said, Sandy, um, is that people are just hurting out there and, and they're not showing their pain. And I've always thought this has been a big problem that People don't tell you they're in trouble until they're practically ready to take a leap off a building or they're starving mm -hmm. or something, you know. And that's like, because we don't share information, I don't think we know how to help each other enough. But I have friends that, I mean, we're talking smart, good people, um, you know, and, and nobody ever considers things like, you know, their computer isn't working properly. Or even like a friend of mine, she's a mother, um, smart, professional. She's couch, essentially couch surf, one, one level up from couch surfing now. Um, there must be a way for us to work together and help each other, but we'd have to do it by disclosing information, at least confidentially. And some people might know a little bit about the, um, the Virtual Brain Trust, Trust Cooperative um, initiative that I've started and basically it's to do that it's so that everybody would have their own private little team where you could strategize and um, and come up with ideas to improve your situation and actually the structure if you want to know the organizational structure it's a cell structure you want to know what a cell structure is it's the same thing the terrorists use you know to devastating effectiveness um, it was initiated by the, or probably most people trace its origin to the French resistance in World War II, but it was later adapted by um, other organizations, and there's no reason why we can't use that as a force of good. In the Virtual Brain Trust Cooperative, we decided to drop the name Cell because we didn't want to attract the attention of Homeland Security. We call it Teams instead, but it's the same thing. And a, a characteristic, an organizational characteristic of, of cells, by the way, I, I have a, a master's degree in public administration, which I never really used. I went on to corporate America. But a, an organiza a organizational characteristic of cells is that they have a purpose. And they also usually have one person that's um, responsible for communication with the outside world. Um, so in our case, the purpose we've adopted is that these individual teams, the purpose of them is the success of one individual. Now, Somebody that's on a team can be on another team that's dedicated to their own success. We've got a few teams going. I've got a team that's helped me immensely, but it's a slow process. But that might feed into some of the things we're doing, the, the virtual accelerator concept, trying to help people that need help. Um, but the same thing, you know, trying to make money, being hard-headed realists, you know, sitting around singing Kumbaya or whatever. I'm hogging the floor. Why don't, um, we haven't heard from... Uh, Jerry, Jerry, why don't you weigh in on just anything, which is kind of 
whatever's on your mind about what we're saying. Gary, can you hear us? Are you muted? We're in the we're in the ma we're in the middle of a major upheaval. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The economies, as we've known them for decades, um, you know, there's a major transformation happening, and I think people are starting to realize that, or at least coming to grips with it. The idea of being an employee uh, is is going to quickly die very very rapidly. It's I mean, as you see this huge um, influx of independent contractor work and people starting up companies. I in fact posted a link in there in the Hangout itself, uh, Hangout chat, uh, from Kaufman that talked about the current age, uh, that it, people would be very surprised to see, see that the average age of uh, new entrepreneurs are actually coming out of the 55 to 64 year old camp and not coming out of the 2023. In fact, the, the, the lower end of the, the scale is basically have, has the least number of entrepreneurs that are, that are starting up. So I think it is kind of an interesting um, time to, you know, be adaptive and flexible and, and get your get your head on in regards to, you know, how you go forward from this. I, I'm not that surprised that the 55 to 64 year old camp is now uh, the one spawning a vast amount of startup. I mean, considering most everyone I know, I'm I'm in the plus 50 camp myself. Um, you know, everybody in their brother's portfolios went to hell in a handbasket three years ago. And you know what they thought was a nifty little nest egg no longer exists. And there's more people in that boat than most people want to admit. Uh, so, you know, everyone's having to kind of reinvent themselves and reinvent, uh, take some of their experience in corporate America or wherever they came from and basically take advantage of this thing that um, spans space and time, i.e. the internet, and utilize it in a mechanism to, you know, create some new future uh, for themselves, for their well, families, for their grandkids. You just validated everything, about everything I've been thinking. So let me think. I don't, I don't want to just, uh, would you guys do me a favor and have a conversation among yourself for just a few minutes? A few people have asked to be invited to this, and we won't, this, this won't be a forever hangout, you know, this may be another 20 minutes or so, but I do want to uh, invite a few more people. So, so have some cross-talk for a while. I want to go do some technical stuff. So somebody else take the floor, please, and moderate yourself for just a few minutes, if you wouldn't mind. Well, Jerry, keep going, because I, you know, I, I think the um, motivation is incredibly relevant, and, and I think you're, you're taking us right down the right path. Yeah, I, uh, it is, to me, it's very interesting what's happening. Um, and, you know, if I, I, I honed my teeth out of, um, uh, in my 20s, uh, in the DoD. Um, so, I mean, I actually started out at Use Aircraft, and kind of where I got, uh, got in touch with my, uh, the technology of the world and it's kind of how my my world progressed but I left I left use five years after starting there to start my first company because I was already disenchanted with corporate America um, you know in fact I was uh, when I was at use the interesting story I used to have was um, they had a fairly aggressive management uh, rotation program and they would hire literally one the first the top one percent out of all the major business schools in the United States so Wharton you name it uh, Harvard so all those guys of course who were my age at that time uh, that had the benefit of going to those awesome business schools they were stuffed into these management programs and they would rotate them in and out of area, every area of use aircraft on three month intervals and I've never seen a more frustrated group of kids in my life. I mean, I was having a great time, and they were just frustrated because they couldn't. They were told to go in and change. They were taught to change the world, yet they wa walked into this huge megaplex called Use Aircraft, and even though they were tasked with changing the world by the management, they couldn't do anything. I mean, they basically were beating their heads against the wall. Um, and every one of them, every one of them out of that management group, um, while I was there, they all left to become entrepreneurs. Each and every one of them, and I think it was kind of the uh, that was kind of the the writing was on the wall in in the 80s that this was kind of the way this was going to go down. And we've seen, you know, we've seen we always hear about the wild successes uh, in the entrepreneurial space. I mean, you know, the the Facebooks of the world, the uh, you know, the Googles of the world. I mean, but fact of the matter, there are a lot of successful entrepreneurs at a much smaller scale. You don't have to be Google. You don't have to be Facebook. Uh, I think what most everyone's looking for is the ability to have a lifestyle that they appreciate um, and you know, and do something that they love. I think for far too long. Uh, especially Americans have been ones that have, you know, been pushed into uh, primarily put pushed into work positions that they don't care for. And I think more people are a lot more cognizant of 
what they're looking for now, or or attempting to right wrongs in 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 regards to their decisions, maybe early on in their lives. You know, how to go to college, how to go go straight out of college, went and straight into working for some engineering firm. I mean, you know, but yet their love and their passion was something else completely. So um, I. I I have a lot of fun now um, talking to a lot of different people from a lot of cross uh, cross sections in life, and um, I really do embrace because I've done it so many times now. Not all successful, um, you know. I've got uh, you know a number of failures on my uh, underneath me, and that's the other thing I tell people. You know, failure is okay. Failure, failure is in fact good in a lot of ways. You you learn a lot from that. So I don't want to I don't want to sit here and talk on and on and on. So. No, th those are great thoughts. One one thing I'm kind of curious about is, you know, looking at the crystal ball, what's going to happen? Because it seems to me our society has almost two systems right right now. There's the the people who are in either government or corporation, and they're doing if they're in if they're in the system, they're fine. Um, and then there's a massive number of solo entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who are not by choice. What they call there's a word for that. I, I forget what it is. Um, and people are just kind of in the independent workforce or, or out of the workforce trying to make it. And it just seems like the twain isn't meeting. I, I knew what corporations should be doing. People like Google, they should be counting. Tomorrow, they should uh, cut 10,000 small business contracts. Maybe 90% of them would fail, like you said. The 10% that didn't would pay off and massively. But there, I don't see corporations really trying to do it. I, I mean, I've, I've talked, I've ranted a little bit about the, the Startup America program. What a what a lost opportunity! It, it got it got taken over by corporate America almost immediately. It was a good concept, but they did have one good thing. The, the stock exchange was um, they were talking about that. They were talking about starting to, you know, really connect with lots of small businesses, but they never did it. And I just see it being like two separate systems right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that is totally the case, and and I uh, you know not to be, I don't want to <laughs> we stay out of the politics of dancing, but but bottom line is I mean personally I see you know I hate to use the word cataclysm, but I really do see something significant happening in the very near future, specifically in regards to the the this this abyss that's being created between government and 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 small business private business. I mean it's just it's it's crazy what's happening. I'm not talking about big corporate America. I'm talking about just some guy trying to make it every day, and I just think it's becoming. Uh, more and more difficult, and I, I think that there's going to be some events that happen that are going to change the way, you know, hopefully change it for the better, but who knows. Um, I'm optimistic still. I'll, I'll remain optimistic, but yeah, there's there's definitely, there's there's a duality now that probably has never existed in the in America as we know it. And that so is, somebody else weigh in on what he just said, because I'll go off on a half hour rant if I... <laughs> oh, no, I absolutely talk. agree. Um, <laughs> the, um, you're... The, the changes, the technology is forcing an awful lot of changes, so you, the, the housing bubble masked a lot of what happened as, as more of our manufacturing jobs moved to, to other economies, and then the housing bubble also masked what was happening as technology began eliminating jobs, and technology is continuing to chew up jobs, so you're... I don't know that our unemployment problem is ever going to go away. So, so for all of those people who are never going to work in a traditional nine to five cubicle job again, they they have to find something. They they have to start a business, whether it's you know being a handyman mowing lawns down the street. You have to find a market for a skill that you have and find people that are going to pay you for that skill. And that's that's ultimately what the the true nature of, of entrepreneurialism is is finding a market that needs something and selling it to them yeah you know, I think one of the interesting ones to keep an eye on now if you want to kind of look at what I think is going to happen from a trend standpoint going forward um, and I'm sure you guys all, or maybe have heard about the downtown project in Vegas that Tony Sy from Zappos is doing uh, and if you haven't it's an interesting thing to go take a look at where you know I hadn't been downtown Vegas in a long long time and uh, probably the last time I was in downtown Vegas is when they had actually just put up that uh, the roofing over over the top of the downtown area, and it had a, still had a fairly nice appearance, whatever. And the last time I was there, oh my, you know what happened? Oh my God, it looks like it, it literally looks like some you know post-apocalyptic thing happened in in downtown uh, Las Vegas. But you know what Tony's doing now is he's you know set aside three hundred million dollars to basically to create the ultimate startup, the ultimate incubator. And he's funding everything from yoga studios to you name it, 
uh, including you know de uh, housing and all the rest of it in the downtown area to basically fa facilitate an entire community um, that are bear basically serial entrepreneurs. Um, it, it's so unbelievable I, some of the stuff that's going on. I didn't know about that one. It sounds amazing. They, they had one on a boat in um, yep. in, in, in San Francisco. Not that I mean a, you know a ship, a cruise liner. They just did one on um, British American Airlines. <laughs> I mean, this was you know the higher the cocktail set, but they had they had a you know big seven four you know uh, Airbus jet, and they had one transatlantic flight from Virgin Airlines doing it. I mean, they're, they're popping up everywhere. Um, I I, just, I don't have a good crystal ball on what's going to happen. I got I don't want to miss the train though. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's going to crash and burn. Well, but yeah. um, like I said, there's there's not that much of a choice. Let me see if I can uh, a couple of the people. Uh, David, can you hear us? David Stark. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Do you have, uh, have any thoughts? Why don't you introduce yourself and, uh, and give us a few thoughts on what you think about this? Sure. Well, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's just been interesting dialogue to listen to. The, uh, the topic intrigued me. Um, my name is David Stark. I happen to be a, a, a budding entrepreneur. I currently work in a, uh, in a large Fortune 50 company, um, but I still have for years had the burning desire to go do something on my own. Um, as I've reached out into my, I live in New York, as I've reached out into some of the uh, accelerators that are available to me where I live, which is somewhat of a suburban area versus Manhattan, just to put it in perspective, um, they look at me like I have, you know, 15 heads, but also that I have a, uh, I'm potential revenue for them, just to, to add another, you know, company to incubate on their list, but they haven't really provided me with any direct assistance. So what do I mean by that? is they want to charge me X hundreds of dollars per month to belong to the accelerator. But where I'm really at in my uh, product development, and it's not a, uh, it, it's a consumer electronics product, is I really need help getting uh, networked or connected to angel investors or uh, rich guys and gals who hang out someplace or maybe even VC funding. I'm, I'm looking ultimately to capitalize at like uh, upwards of a half a million dollars, which as you probably all know from your own personal experience, is probably a little bit below the radar of a VC, but might be right in the zone for an angel. Um, so my, my question is, uh, do you have any advice for someone like myself who has a small electronics product? It's not the next Facebook. Uh, it's not the next you know, Google product. It's not going to uh, s you know, stave off world peace and, and, and hunger kind of thing. Um, but I'm having a real devil of a time getting to that next level of funding beyond some loans and so forth. I, I don't have advice, but I, I have an observation. <laughs> I don't know if you'll like it. But there, there's a little, little dirty little, not, not about you personally, just about society. There, there's a little uh, dirty little secret about what's going on now from people who do have government and corporate jobs. I think virtually all of them are working on their own startups on the job. And yeah. it gives them tremendous leverage that the rest of us don't have. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, to various various levels of being serious. Some of them are just dabbling a little hobby. But some of them, I had a friend, uh, and he had a job. I better not say too much because I don't want to lose him as a friend. But he had a job with a public agency. And at the same time, he had a energy consulting firm. And he literally ran this side business while working at this government agency. And he said the people at this government agency, they were so into like, you know, they had their coffee breaks. He got his job so he could do his entire job in an hour each day. And his performance, actual metrics, was better than any of the other employees so they couldn't say anything. And he completely built a very, very successful practice while working <laughs> another job. And that wasn't really related to your question, but... Um, I have kind of, some input, David. Sure, no, I, I, and, and uh, by the way, Rob, you know, thank you. Um, I know a lot of people that do dabble in the background. There's something to be said for being gainfully employed and getting benefits while you do dabble. Yeah. Uh, the, the negative to that is that you don't, um, you know, you're not being held, your, your feet aren't being held to the fire because so, you have the luxury of time, which is also the detriment, right? right. You, yep. you, you yep. kind of drag Absolutely. it out forever. Um, that all being said, it still, for me, comes back to a... Uh, know a, a money kind of thing um, Sandy uh, thank you for your your comment 
Um, I have tried crowdfunding uh, like a Kickstarter kind of venue, but they kind of kicked me out. I'm just finding because I have a full-time job, it's hard for me to during the daytime at any rate to go network and find uh, the people that I can really get excited about what I have to do and what hey, I'm David, offering. David, I got a, maybe a couple observations. Um, okay. Um, first and foremost, um, on the I would this this is really for anybody that's taking a look at accelerators. One of the things about accelerators, and there there are there are probably too many of them actually now, uh, honestly. Um, you really have to take a look at what success rate of that accelerator is. And in other words, I mean, who who have successfully you know been ejected out the other side of the accelerator? I mean, what did that look like? What kind of company was it when it started? What you know when they got there? What did they look like? What did they look like when they left? I mean, you really need to do like anything. You have to do some some level of due diligence on those places that you want to call home, okay, or you want to be affiliated with. Um, I would also recommend f specifically for you because you fall into the camp I talked about earlier which is really the maker community when you start looking at um, electronics and you start looking at light manufacturing that that is really what uh, if you're not familiar with the term what the maker community is it's you know basically guys that are in robotics and electronics and uh, pretty much anything you know from an artisan craft standpoint um, that's the maker community take it from scratch and go from there you know 3d printing is actually considered part of the maker community um, I give you a website to take a look at, and it's actually this is the actual um, uh, accelerator out of San Francisco. It's called Tech Shop, okay. and the URL at Tech Shop is TechShop.ws. Um, so www.TechShop.ws. Okay. Um, take take a look at the way Tech Shop is constructed, the way they talk about what they do, um, and I would highly recommend that you may, might reach out to that environment. They are well connected uh, across the United States to people of like mindedness, and okay. I think for, specifically for where you are in New York on the Eastern Seaboard, they would be probably the appropriate person to reach out to, or group the or the forum there, or however you want to contact them. I know that they're very open to these dis discussions, and I think you probably you're probably going to get all the right advice coming out of Tech Shop uh, versus you know some random accelerator that you that popped up in the area. So it's trying to get money off you too. So yeah, I, th I think that's really be, be very focused uh, again. Do, I wanna, um, due diligence. Thank you, thank you guys. Yeah, I want to say hi to, to Lauren. I, I don't. Lauren is in a rural area in the desert of California. She's a friend of mine. She's an attractive woman that you can't you can't see right now. Lauren, can you hear us or not? I just wanted to say hi to you. Maybe she's having. Hi, Rob. Hi, hi, Lauren. What's your opinion on can all this you hear stuff? Me? Kind of. Um, I think it's very very interesting. Okay, I think it's really interesting because I am working with some different smaller businesses um, that are trying to kickstart products as well as uh, develop their their businesses locally in local different communities. So it's uh, very interesting um, to hear um, all of this input. Um, uh, food for thought later. Okay, thank you. And Lauren, you know, is is in a rural area, and that's another reason why I think we need a. Uh, and Lauren, you might have to mute your mic now. We're getting to feedback. Well, but why I think we need to start looking at the virtual. I know other people are probably doing it, but we do have this cool hangout technology. Um, we're getting on an hour now. This this went in a lot of different directions. It, it was fascinating, and I think we've just barely barely scratched the surface on this topic. But I want to wind it down. I want to give everybody a parting shot. Um, Especially, um, Sandy, why don't you um, why don't you give us your, your thoughts, and anyone else anyone else anyone else wants to jump in, um, and then of course we're all friends. We can keep talking, you know, after the meeting and, and in the coming days and weeks. But, but Sandy, why don't you just, on anything? Uh, what's your opinion? Um, on that? Actually, I just wanted to echo what Jerry just said that you you do your research because an accelerator program is not right for everyone. You, you really have to, it's, some people thrive in that environment and like for me it's the best thing I could possibly have done. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled with FI, I'm thrilled with my program, but what, what's right for me is not right for everyone. You know, it, and for somebody who's a maker like, like David, I think Jerry's advice was spot on, that he needs to be in the maker community. He's going to find a lot more 
resources and support from people who who are makers than than from a tech accelerator where there there's a different type of focus. Excellent. Um, yes, we just broke on so many important issues in, in this one. Anybody else want to weigh in? And then I'm gonna um, I'm gonna kind of wind the meeting down. Uh, then in the broadcast, we can still talk for two more minutes informally here if you want, and then you know any time beyond that. Anyone else have any parting shots you want to make? I, I know we can't cover this broad of a topic. And Elizabeth, any other thoughts? Um, I'll quote with some. Oh. Go ahead, Jared. Now go ahead, Elizabeth. She was going to say something. Oh no no no. I'll, I'll, I'll quote my, my, uh, one of my great inspirations in life. Um, and that quote is, is a simple one, and one that rings in my ear, it seems, every morning, which is, if you're lucky enough to get up, take a breath, put your pants on, and get to work. <laughs> well, that, that's probably a, a perfect segue into the end of this program. Um, a couple issues I just want to mention we've broached here. The vast, vast number of, of small enterprises. We've got to get it together. We got to throw everything about, except the kitchen sink against that problem because it's there. We've got the technology here on Google. We just got to do it. We do have a virtual accelerator program um, or concept. I've got a working group for it now. We're serious about building it of some kind. I know there's the knowledge out there, so contact me if you're interested in that. And also, I have had over 40, over 40, over 50 issue we broached here. That ain't going away. So that's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Anyway, I really want to thank you all for, for joining us, both people um, here have joined us in the discussion, the people just listened in, either you know live or, or later. Um, this has been the Let's Talk About series that's sponsored by the Entrepreneurs Small Business, excuse me, Entrepreneurs Self-Employed and Small Business Community on Google+. We get together formally, usually every week, just talk about a given topic. Today was, uh, as you know, uh, Business and Startup Accelerators. Fascinating. We barely scratch the surface. So um, that's all for this time, and we'll we'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us.